Hey guys, Dre Aven here with NBA and Lakers legend Byron Scott. He won three NBA titles as a player. He made a huge impact throughout the league as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He really shined during the Showtime era. He was one of the front forward faces of that time that really ignited the court, ignited the fans. Then he went on to coach, made an impact there, has made an impact in the broadcasting world. He has a new podcast coming out that we're going to talk about. So I'm super excited that he's here. And I'm also excited about the Ridge Wallet brand. I'm super pumped to be part of their team. I love compact things that are also luxurious and also very functional. This wallet really does the trick for me. You can fit up to 12 cards in here, even as small as it is. You can put cash in the back and there's up to 30 different styles, colors, and just kind of vibes you can look at. So I want you guys to check out ridge.com slash Drea 500. When you get there, type in Drea 500 again to get your discount. You won't regret getting this wallet. They have over 40,000 five-star reviews online. So get your Ridge wallet today. This is my favorite wallet right now, for sure. So Byron, thank you so much for having me today. This is so exciting. We're here. It's a Friday night. Yep. Hanging out with an NBA legend. This is how me and my camera guy, Alan, we like to spend our nights like this if we're able to. <laughs> so Byron, thank you. And we're in the cognac room. This is... We talked yeah. a little bit about this off camera. This is where you relax, mm-hmm. maybe have a drink. There's the golf vibe. Maybe the golf channel is like the permanent channel mm-hmm. on the TV behind mm-hmm. us. Tell me about just why it's so important for you to have this kind of a vibe, like this yeah. good kind of a vibe. I yeah. love it. I feel relaxed. I feel like I want to dream. I was telling Byron, yeah. I can't do that, but I just love the feeling here. I, it's so relaxing. Yeah, you know what? I think every man has to have a room where he can... Like a man cave. Yeah, kind of yeah. go and escape, yeah. you know, and just relax. And this is my room, you know. I yeah. come in here and uh, I, I got an assortment of uh, tequila and, uh, and, and, you know, other stuff. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, every now and then say, okay, I haven't opened this. Let me take a, you know, let me take a sip of this. And right. the room is made where it's kind of soundproof where I could also pull out one of my stogies and watch, watch TV as well. So yes. it's just my... My little hideaway, my little getaway room, just to kind of, uh, you know, relax, decompress. I love it. And just try to enjoy a little bit. Yeah, well, that's all. That's what it's all about. It's about relaxing, enjoying. Like, we do a lot of stuff. We want to come home and, like, decompress. I feel like Correct. this room, the aura is just so amazing. Well, Byron, I want to start out. What I loved about the way that you played was the three things that really stood out to me just watching you was your athleticism, your ability on the fast break, and your three-point prowess. Mm. So. When you look at your youth basketball and how you evolved, what was it in your training that really helped you thrive as a three-point shooter? That's a hard, I mean, that's the furthest shot back. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, Robert Ori and I used to talk about that when I was covering the Spurs, how hard it is to make that shot from that far back. So why were you so good at it? Well, I think, first of all, you need upper body and lower body strength. Yeah. You know, to be able to shoot that shot, uh, you know, and make it look effortless, mm-hmm. you got to have those components. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think after that, then obviously you have to have right technique. You know, you have to have that, that good form, that Steph Curry, yeah. you know, elbow in. You know, Paige, Paige Stark was one of my favorite three-point oh, shooters yeah, back in the day, yeah, yeah. along with Reggie Miller, who I played with, you know, who I love to death. Uh, yep. But those guys, you know, you, you have to have an ability to be able to just focus on the basket, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and Reggie technique. was the technique in the basket. Reggie was a little different. Most great shooters, when they shoot the ball and release it, they're still looking at the target. Reggie would shoot the ball and then look up at the ball. And oh, still was able to be so good at it, you know. But okay. most great shooters, if you watch a player, to you know today when they play, when they release the basketball, they're not their eyes aren't going up there towards the ball. It's okay. still focused in on the rim. On the rim. Okay. And I used to always say, I always aim for the back of the rim. Okay. Um, aim for the front. You hit the front, it has no chance of going. It hits the back a little bit. At it least might. It, has a it might bump going. back in. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So I that was kind of my my way of uh, you know lining up my shot and. You know, I always say point my index finger into the rim as well. Okay. You know, so, and I and I think the rest of it is, you know, my, my father played ball mm-hmm. at, at Weber State. He was known as a great shooter. I think some of it is just God given. Right. And you were born down in genetics. You, yes, absolutely. And you know, you look at Steph Curry. Well, Dale, his dad, who I played against, was a hell of a shooter as well. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, so that was kind of trickled down to him. Yeah. So you know, but as uh, far as technique wise, you know, you have to have the technique, but you have to have great lower and upper body strength. Yeah, yeah, and you really showcased that. A lot of fans love to watch you behind the arc and and what you were able to accomplish there. What I love about what you guys brought to the table, the Showtime era, I don't think any other team has really been able to duplicate just the the whole energy, the aura, Mm. the magic of coming to the forum and seeing you guys play. Like, that was the spot. This was before digital, social media 
helps a lot of us now. But back then, it was just about coming to those games. And you guys were, that's what Dr. Bus wanted. He wanted you guys to perform. What was it like being a part of that as a player? Like, yeah. just stepping in the building, it was like Magic, Kareem, Byron Scott, Coop. Like, the guys, that was, you guys were the rock stars. Yeah. That was it. It was great. Yeah. You know, because we, we wanted to do that. We wanted to come in every night and put on a show. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think that's why Magic you know, just came up with it, it's showtime. It's because showtime. he knew when he stepped on the court, yeah. you know, it was all business, obviously. You know, right. we, were, we were all obviously trying to win games and win championships, but he also wanted to make sure when the fans left, they would see something that they hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted to give them that show. And that's, uh, that's the reason I think that team keeps being talked about because yep. of that era and the way we played the game. Mm -hmm. You know, how many games we won, how many championships we won, but it's the style and the way we played it as well that I think keeps attracting people to the 80s uh, Showtime. Yeah, it was. And you guys, the thing is, you were credible, but you were also flashy and fun. Sometimes right. it's right. one side or the other. Like sometimes someone, you know, can win, but they're not that fun. Right. Or they're flashy, but they're not that great. Yeah. You guys <laughs> not won. That good, yeah. Right. You guys had that combination that was just so intriguing for so many fans and celebrities, like that whole thing was just so amazing. There's a picture that I saw, I talked to Coop about this, where Kurt Rambis, AC's in the front, you guys all have your glasses, your sunglasses yeah. on on the yacht. What was, what was the story behind that picture? Was that an ad or what was, why were you guys all looking so just movie star-ish with your sunglasses on, the shades, everybody had like a pose, yeah. was trying to look cool. What was that for? Because I just it saw was, it like online. I wasn't, it, I didn't it was, know what it yeah, was. Yeah, it was just a poster we it wanted. It was just a poster? Do. You know, it, it, it really <laughs> wasn't really anything behind it besides okay. the fact that we wanted to do something fun. Okay. And I, and I think Gary Vitti kind of came up with the idea of doing it on a boat. Right. You know, and all of us being in our Laker gear and our son, you know. And, our, and it was also kind of to uh, <laughs> continue the stereotype that everybody kind of thought of. You know, Hollywood, right. Showtime, you know, they showtime, cool. Showtime, sunglasses, and they, these yeah, guys are Yeah, you know, cool. and, you know, it's Hollywood, but you're the beach and all that stuff. And we kind of played into it, you know, for that particular picture. And, it, and the, the good thing it. about that picture it was a lot of fun doing it on the boat and everything. And like you said, everybody had their shades on. Everybody had their shades on. And we Even were just like vibing. Kurt Rambis yeah, looked yeah. really cool. Kurt, like you know, everybody Superman was just like, had his what up? Yeah. On. yeah, it was it was a it was a it was a great poster and a lot of fun to do. Yeah. And I still get a kick out of seeing that poster every now and then because yeah. I think it's one of the better posters that we are that we were able to do as a group and as, as a group. Like yeah, the absolutely. Well, Byron, you made your impact as a player, and what I think is interesting about your transition, and not everybody's able to do this, is when you went from being a player to a coach. You won Coach of the Year in 2008. Mm -hmm. You made an impact. We're going to get to Shaq and Kobe in a little bit, but you made an impact on so many players. What was it like for you, and what did you learn about yourself just looking at the game through the prism of a coach after being at such a high level as a player? Not everybody can, can make that transition and do it well. It's two totally different things even though it's the same sport yeah. it's a different you saw yourself through a different lens as a coach what did you learn about yourself well Drea first of all I didn't know I, I didn't have no inkling of becoming a coach when I was in the NBA okay. you know the first four or five years I wasn't thinking about coaching mm -hmm. uh, Pat Riley told me one day that you know when you become a coach you know you'll kind of understand some of the things that I have to right. go through and you were and like, like yeah like, yeah whatever yeah, you crazy <laughs> And I, I straight told him, I said, Riles, you crazy. I ain't coaching. I ain't going to never coach. You crazy. Wow, At that you, time. So you literally were that demonstrative. You were yeah, like, I'm I was never like, going to coach. Yeah, I'm never coaching. I was in my fourth or fifth year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fast forward, I go to Indiana. Mm -hmm. You know, playing with, you know, playing with Reggie you right. know, Miller and, and some of these great guys over there. The Davis boys and Rick Smith and all, you know, yeah, Pooh Richardson. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we had a really good team. And Larry Brown was the coach. And mm -hmm. every day at practice, Larry Brown would say, you know, by how would you guys guard this? How would you do this? How would you do that? Oh, so he called you by. He that called me your, by. Okay, so by I didn't yeah, know that just, that was your nickname. Yeah, he okay. called me by. You know, everybody else called me B, but he called okay. me by for some reason. He just called <laughs> me by. And so I would show him how we would double down on the post from the from the uh, uh, from the elbow or from the nail mm -hmm. or from the wing. Mm -hmm. And he was he would just look at us and say, All right, let's let's do it that way. And one day after practice, he said, you know what, I think you would be a great coach if you ever decided to coach. And that, that kind of got that me was the going moment. because I was like, Pat Riley said it, Larry, Bur Larry Brown said it. So you got two Hall of Famers that see something in, in you, me that, that I don't see, see in myself. Yourself. Exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I started keeping a journal and start really paying more attention to it and, and start, you know, kind of putting on my hat when I would be sitting there on the bench uh, and watching the Florida game and thinking about what I would do as a, if I was a coach. At that particular time, and so that kind of got it rolling. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So yeah. when I got the opportunity to coach, um, I still had a player's mentality, 
you know, because mm -hmm. I was able to relate to players. Because I just you were fresh a player off, at a high level. I just fresh, just freshly got out of the NBA. You know, yeah. I was still, you know, relatively young at 36. And, you know, Rick Adelman gave me my first opportunity to coach in Sacramento as yep. assistant coach. And luckily we had, you know, Jason Williams, White Chocolate, who was yeah. great. One of my <laughs> favorite people in the whole world. Yeah. Chris Weber, yep. Hall of Famer, Vladi yep. Divac, one of my, another one of my favorite people, uh, Pazer Strakovich. We had such a really good young team, and he yep. gave me, you know, Rick gave me the opportunity to say, okay, I want you to work with the guards and the small forwards, and oh. and I was like, what do you want me to do? He said, whatever you want to do. Whatever you feel yeah, like you just, need I to want do. You, I want you to teach them, send them through drills, and that got a, a, even more of a, a, a serious taste in my mouth about becoming a coach. Yeah. So. When I got the call from Jersey um, to go up there and talk to Rod Thorne, it was kind of a no-brainer. I was I was really set on being a head coach at that particular time, and okay. I really felt that, you know, I could lend a lot to especially young guys because of the fact that I had played in the league, I right. had won championships, and you had the respect, like you played at a the, high level. So yeah. they're like, if Byron Scott says something, yeah, we're gonna listen. Yeah. Like that's it. I had a good resume going into it. So right, right. And, and I would always tell him, I said, listen, I'm not gonna have you do anything that I never done. Mm-hmm. You know, Pat Riley would send us through hell doing drills, and I'm gonna have <laughs> you doing like, them too. So, <laughs> so if you think this is something that I'm just doing to you guys because I'm mad, it's not. It's, I said, listen, is you know, he had us do all this stuff, and I'm gonna have you guys do it. Obviously, we were able to win championships with it, so right. it's good so enough. Right, so it works. It's good so enough. So it's good to go enough to the for top, me. Right. So it's gonna have to be good enough for you guys. So, that's really what got me started, and um, had a great career mm -hmm. in coaching and yeah. 17 years of doing it. So, mm -hmm. uh, I was just very blessed. Yeah, well, I thought you did amazing. Like I said, it's not always an easy switch. People it's would not, think yeah. on paper it looks like it, but it's really not. You have to adjust your thinking, and the way you're dealing with people is different than if you're a teammate. It's a more like authoritative, so you have yeah. to like adjust to all of that. Well, Shaq and Kobe have both talked about what an enormous impact that you've had as a mentor. As when they started out young in the league, you really impacted them. They, I've read several articles where they've talked about that. So let's do it twofold. Let's start with Kobe, RIP Kobe. We love, mm -hmm. we love Kobe. What was the biggest impact that you having the opportunity to mentor Kobe, what did that have on you? What's the biggest impact with that? He said that you had an impact on him. Oh. What did he have on you? Yeah, I was gonna say he had much more of an impact on me than I think I had on him. Well, I mean, you know, that I, was I what mean, he said, so yeah. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's yeah. just Kobe, you being, know, Co yeah. being Kobe. Being and, Kobe. You know, I mean, we had an unbelievable relationship at, at 17 and a half years old, I'm 36. I was old enough to be his dad. Yep. And, you know, but I, I never treat, and I, I would tell him, I said, you, you know what, you could be my son, basically, you know. Yeah. But the thing that I loved about him is he was like a sponge. You know, Soaked he would always up. come to me and ask me questions. We would sit on the bench, he would ask me questions. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I try to do with him is just show him how to be a professional, mm -hmm. number one, and show him how to get prepared for games um, and how to be ready. Mm -hmm. And his work ethic, you know, as much as I told him that he had to do this, this, and this, he went above and beyond mm -hmm. that. His work you know, ethic his work was, ethic like was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah. So, you know, as Maybe. much as he said I had an impact on him, he really impacted me because of the fact that he allowed me to help him. Mm -hmm. And he was so receptive. And he was so to receptive. Your, he didn't try to and fight back anything. Never tried to fight. Yeah. You know, never, yeah. never tried to. Uh, you know, look at me like, man, you old, what are you talking about? You <laughs> right. know what I mean? He like a lot of the you. young guys do. He had uh, nothing but respect, and, and he, he gave that respect to me every single day. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I gave it right back because, mm -hmm. you can, you know, if you want to be respected, you got to be respectful. You got to be respectful. And I like that. he was that and some, you know. Yeah. So not only on the basketball court, you know, we would talk off the court. We would talk, you know, at the, at the beach. Mm -hmm. We would go to the beach and just walk around the beach and talk about mm -hmm. basketball. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, as much as he said, you know, that I had an impact on him, mm -hmm. he had just as much, as, if not bigger, impact on me because I, I thought he kept me relevant because of the fact that if he wasn't there, I don't know if I would have been able to uh, give that type of support to anybody else. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he was so receptive. And we had, we had some really good guys on that team. Yeah. You know, yep. Eddie Jones, you know, Nick Van Exel. We had some really good basketball players mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but Kobe was the one guy that would come to me every day and we would talk about basketball mm -hmm. he, that, you could tell he lived and breathed and he just he, loved basketball he loved it <laughs> yeah. to the point where uh, and I think all the great ones you know they sacrifice certain parts of their lives to be great yeah you know certain part of their personal lives 
you know, oh, so to yeah. speak. And, yeah. and, and Kobe was one of those guys, you Amazing. know, he wanted to be great. And he, he was able to be he just was able that. to be an one of the greatest, one ever. of the greatest to play. What about Shaq? Let's shift to him. He's talked about you as well. What impacted you having the chance to mentor him and talk to him have on you? He said that it, for as far as he's concerned, it had a huge impact on him. But what did what kind of an impact did he have on you? Let's let's flip the script. Let's reverse it back to you. Yeah, I mean his impact was almost like uh, Kareem's impact when I first came to the Lakers. Okay. In, in a reverse way. I, I mean, I was a youngster, and I'm looking at this guy who I know is one of the greatest ever, oh, if yeah. not the greatest ever. I'm on the, the other spectrum now. I'm at the end of my career, and I'm looking at this other young guy who can be the greatest ever. He has that ability. So he affected me uh, on a personal level in a very positive way because of his, his um, I wouldn't say mm-hmm. fearlessness, but his his affectionness about the, the type of player that he was, but he was also a player that loved to enjoy the game mm-hmm. and he loved yeah. to have fun. Shaq was the biggest prankster yeah. that I've ever seen <laughs> for a big man. And I yeah. think at times he didn't realize that he was seven feet 290, mm-hmm. you know, because he's grabbing and wrestling people that are, you know, five feet, you know, 185 pounds, and he could literally break them if, if he landed on them. Or, but, but, but that was just his personality. He had a very infectious personality. And I love that about him because it kept me young. Yeah. Being around him. Yeah. And it his kept personality. Me young, you know, and, and I love that about him that he took everything with a grain of salt. Yeah. You know, I mean, basketball was all of our lives, and uh, at times some of us take it too serious. Right. And I you think, love it so much. yeah, but I think Shaq had a uh, a way of keeping it at a, at a lighter level, yeah. which also, you know, kind of kept the tension down. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've told, I told in a couple of my NFL interviews, I've told the story of how I interviewed Kobe when I was in college. I was a security guard. People don't believe that because I don't seem like I would have been a security guard. <laughs> I was. I was a security guard. I had the whole outfit on and Kobe gave me an interview at the Staples Center when I was in school. I've told the depth of that story before, but I haven't told this Shaq story. Um, so I'm going to share it with the audience today. But I was a couple years ago, I was going through a really dark place in my life. Like I was having some personal issues and I was having some setbacks on the TV side of my career and Shaq called me. I didn't even know he had my number, but he called me. He was, he said that he was driving on Rodeo drive and something told him to call me. And I was sitting on my couch. I was eating a $5 frozen dinner and this man's on (laughs) Rodeo drive. I'm like the poor sports reporter. Right. And he goes, Drea, you know, don't give up. He's like, I just want to tell you, like, keep pushing forward. Don't give up. And I was just venting to him and he was a good listener. Mm. And I think that's something that people don't really know about him because he's like a prankster and he has such a big personality, but he just listened. Like I had a lot of stuff to say and it's stuff that maybe just my parents and my brother know. And I just went, I just unloaded it on him and he absorbed it. <laughs> he circled me back. He's like, just promise me that you're never going to give up. And so it was like an hour and a half conversation that lifted me up. And ever since then, like I always think about that when I have a bad day or whatever. So I just, want people to know what kind of man Shaq is away from the spotlight and all his endorsements. And you see him on all these commercials, but he's like a really good guy that helped me out of a really tough time in my life. So, you know what? It's funny. It's really cool. Yeah. That, that's a great story. Cause yeah. Shaq is that, but Kobe, it's the same with Kobe Yeah. because there's Kobe Bryant that a lot of people don't know. Right. Who is the family man. And if you saw him with Gigi and his girls, you see how much he loved Loves his them. children and children yeah. in general. Uh, yeah. cause there were, you know, a few occasions where I wanted him to meet a kid and the kid would come in. And of course, he would look at Kobe like, oh, my God. And Kobe would treat him like he's yeah. his best friend. <gasps> oh and Shaq God, was the that. same way. And then with both of those, there, there's the Shaq on the basketball court and then there's the black mama right. on the basketball court. So, they're you know, they're, they're, different they're, they're guys, totally different. But that's so cool. They can, like, compartmentalize and, like, they could turn you have on to. the diesel part. Yeah. And, like, Shaq was Yeah, there's even, Shaq like, Diesel on that basketball court yeah, just ready to kill and he you. Had, like, he was a rapper. Like, he had a lot yeah. of different sides yeah. to him. And same thing, Kobe. Same it seemed thing like Kobe, he yeah. was really amazing as well. All right, guys. Well, it is time for my favorite segment, your favorite segment, the three-minute play with DA. You guys love this. This is one of the reasons why I started my own interviews. I have a huge personality so we can peel back the layers. So it's rapid fire questions showing you more about your favorite <laughs> athletes off the NBA basketball court, off the NFL football field, off the golf wings, outside of the Olympic swimming pool, whatever it is that they do. We like to peel back the layers. So Byron, you ready? I'm okay, ready. So rapid fire. Okay. So let's go back to Showtime okay. and let's think about your teammates. Who out of the Showtime era currently do you talk to on the phone the most now? AC Green. 
Oh my God. Shout out to AC, Dre Avon Productions, <laughs> AC Green. AC Green. Another interview that we did. Okay, so what is it about AC? Why do you think that you guys are that close? Like, what is it about his personality that really just like resonates or you guys feel like you're talking all the time? We're not talking all the time. No, but are you I talking mean, to him the most? I, yeah, I talk to him okay. the most because okay. I talk to James because James plays golf. I talk to okay. Coop because Coop has a podcast. I have a podcast. But, yeah. You know, yeah. I talk to Irvin because he has parties and or what you know what I mean. So I talk to all of them, <laughs> yeah. but I talk to That's AC so cool. the you guys most. Are all close. Yeah, we're we're so all still close. very close, but okay. I talk to AC the most, and I think a lot of it's because uh, he's my daughter's godfather as well. Oh, sweet. Um, okay. We we are also both uh, men of God, you know. So we talk, you know, about that as well. We invite each other, just like I invite the other guys at times to events that we're doing. Yeah. But when it's all said and done, out of all the Showtime guys, I probably, I'm, I'm pretty sure I talk to AC probably the most. Okay, so let's get behind, let's let's pull back the, the velvet curtain here. And what's a memory that you had with AC Green back when you guys were playing that was like a <laughs> private, I mean, it's something that you can say on oh, camera yeah, yeah, okay. that you guys really bonded, that is something that like you didn't really, haven't really talked about. What's an AC Byron Scott moment where the two of you guys like really had a moment away from the cameras, away from the spotlight, just the two, just two guys hanging out. Uh, when he first got to LA, um, you know, he was okay. a rookie, okay. really didn't know a whole lot of people. Me and him kind of gravitated towards each other because... You know, being being the only rookie on the team when I was there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but luckily I was here at home in L.A. <laughs> okay. He wasn't at home. You okay. Know, so I kind of gravitated towards him to have him to spend more time with him, to bring mm -hmm. him to the house, to have him for dinner and things like that. Um, and that was kind of the, the one time that we talked about that he didn't have anybody here. And, oh um, you know, he really appreciated the fact that we became friends and, we, we talked about everything, you know, we talked about the Bible, because at that time, AC was really into his religion. Yeah, that was like a big story. That was like a big the story. whole, like, yeah, dating. Was a big story, like, yeah. It was a huge story. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that I was always telling them about is that there's a lot of, you know, women here in L.A. that's going to be after you. So I'm my job <laughs> is to keep you away from all the damn Jezebels that's going to be Jezebels! trying to get <laughs> that's gonna be trying to get you, AC. <laughs> So that was one of my jobs that I took like, a lot of pride in. I was the gatekeeper. Like, okay, let me interview you. I'm going to make sure when like they come around. Junior, come on, man. No, no, no. no, no you ain't messing with her. She ain't, no. So, I mean, that, that's, I <laughs> that's one of the stories that a lot of people don't know about is that I would be like, no, no, no. You coming with me. You're not staying over there. Nowhere near right, over there. Right, because he really didn't know. He had like, no he, idea. Like, had He's no from idea. Oregon. He had yeah, no he idea was, like, about really being in L.A. and, and like, how L.A. Women, could like, just eat you up. And, yeah. Like, the, and and I grew like, up so here. So many beautiful women here. Yeah, and I grew up here. So I, I was, I was, you know, I was really on guard to make sure that that he didn't have. A slip up or anything, you know. I want. I just wanted to make sure he was gonna be okay. I love that. You were <laughs> Byron Scott, AC's gatekeeper. I was his GK, gatekeeper. GK. That's right. Well, Byron, I wanted to talk before we got into the three minute play. I did want to ask you about your podcast. So let's spotlight mm. your podcast. Mm. This is so exciting. I read kind of like a little bit about your promotional stuff about it, and you're gonna have not just athletes but like comedians. Yeah, yeah. Break down the Byron Scott podcast. What can we expect? Where can we listen to it? I'm going to be listening to like the first couple episodes for sure. So break <laughs> it down for everybody. B Scott podcast. Yeah, What's you, up? you can listen to it, Dre, on any any uh, platform that has podcasts. Okay. You know, we're, we're going to be everywhere. Okay. Um, and the, the, the one thing that I want to do when I when I talked about doing this podcast, mm -hmm. you know, my wife had been bugging me about doing it. And then, you know, luckily we ran into Cody uh, Wallace, who's a a producer of podcasts and we were at a luncheon and it was it, the luncheon was not about the podcast it was about s some other business ventures that we were talking about oh cool um okay. and when we were talking with the guys about these other business ventures we went around the room everybody introduced themselves cody wallace introduces himself and we're sitting right across from each other and then he starts talking to me about podcasts mm -hmm. and i was like you gotta be kidding me because my wife is sitting there and she's like see i told you we should do a podcast see and so i said all right let's talk some more okay. and and you know to, to, to kind of speed up the story, uh, we started to you know get into it, and I said, let's try it. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I told him is, I don't want this to be just a sports podcast. I yeah. don't want to just do athletes. Um, I want to do you know athletes, entertainers, comedians. Actors. I don't want actors. Mm -hmm. I want to do women in sports, women in business. Cool. Nice. Uh, men in business. I don't want this to be just a one-sided thing. And so uh, our first 
first episode is you know September 29th. That'll be the first episode, and James Worthy is the guy that we're featuring. Oh, in the first sweet! Episode. Big game James big game in the James. building. Yeah, big game James. Nice. And, uh, we had we have a comedian, we have a football player, mm-hmm. uh, and, and now I'm trying to get ready for season two because we're having ten episodes for season one. Then we're gonna probably take about a month or two off, and then hit it and back. Then we'll hit it back for you know? season so I'm, two. I'm lining up season two. Nice. And some great names, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard, oh, you know, amazing. Jamie Fox, you know, and really? Dave Winfield. And I, I just ran into him at the uh, the Charger Dallas game, and I said, I need y'all on my podcast. There was, there was some fights at that game. I know. It's always <laughs> it fights. It's so, always it fights at so football ratchet. games. You know, okay, but no, I was I in the suite, so I was like, I don't care. <laughs> you can fight all y'all want down there. We, right, we good up we here. We good up here. We up top. <laughs> Shoot. So I was running into my boys up there, and I was like, I need y'all on my podcast. All of them was like, B, let's let us know. Here's my number. Let us know. You so. You, I, I thought it was great, you know, to start it now because of all the contacts and all the people that I know mm-hmm. throughout the years that I formed relationships with and some of the stories that we have that we can kind of tell, you know, our, our viewers mm-hmm. that they will never hear. Yeah, that's you amazing. Know? And, and that's the good thing about it is we've had some private moments that are that are good enough to tell, you know, <laughs> and sure share, you know, yeah. and, and I think it would be just a lot of fun. And so far in the first thing, it's been so much fun just reconnecting with all the guys that I've been, you know, doing mm-hmm. uh, the podcast with and uh, just Kicking back telling, stories. Yeah, telling the stories, having a drink of wine while we're on the set. I love and it. Just, and, just, and just relaxing and having a good time. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm super pumped about it. I saw that you were doing it. And then that's when I reached out to you again. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. We got to get together. We got to promote your podcast because I think it's going to be so interesting just to see you on that side of it. You've done a lot of good broadcasting work, but in a more relaxed setting with mm-hmm, your friends mm-hmm. or just kind of hanging out with Jamie Foxx. Maybe we, you said you have a studio, but yes, yes, you guys can hang out, have a drink like it's super cash, like just you and your boys. So you guys look out for that. I want to That's talk right. to you about your wife. I, I oh, she's yes. stunning, number one. Thank you. But we personality's big for me as well. So I like a guy that looks good, but personality's up there too. So I want to <laughs> talk about your wife and what is your number one thing, or you can do a top two that you mm-hmm. love about her personality. We get it, she's gorgeous, but let's peel back, let's get into her personality. What do you love most, or the top two things you <laughs> love most about her personality? I what love, she brings to your life. Oh man, her, her yeah. personality is such a fun uh, personality. She mm-hmm. loves to laugh. She loves to make fun of me and herself. <laughs> that's good. She that, that's kind of number one. Number two, she's clumsy as hell. Okay. I mean, every that's, day okay. she's breaking something, you <laughs> okay. know. And, and it's now to the point where she broke something this morning. She was walking in just. And I just turn around and just shake my head. Because you're used to it. I'm you're so like, used oh, to it now. Something else went left and, here. And she'll look at me, help me. I say, help you with what? You, you mm-hmm. know, you didn't already broke it. What do, you, what do you want me to do? Mm-hmm. But I think the thing that I love about her personality the most is the fact that every day, there hasn't been a day that we've been together that has gone by where we don't laugh. Oh, we, we just that's enjoy amazing. each other's, you know, we laugh yeah. and we cuddle um, every night just sitting on the couch, hugged up, watching movies. Just like and that, that contact. Just contact, yeah. you know. I love it. And, and I, I, I love that. I love her personality. I love the way that she laughs. Mm-hmm. I love the way that she can make fun of herself as well as fun of me. Mm-hmm. And um, that laughter every day that we that we share, you know, it, it's, it's just it's special. Oh, it's, it's really special, and I, and I, I love, love that about her. Romance is alive and well here at Pirate's House. I love <laughs> y'all it. Y'all about to say, at least in this house it is. <laughs> okay, but that's, that's, that's where we're here. We want to find out what those Romance is alive and well in this house. That's I don't know about other it. houses out there, but in <laughs> right. this one is But this good. is where we are tonight. So this is what we know. Okay, Byron, I was thinking about this. Last night I ate half a pint of ice cream oh. while I was watching Netflix. So okay. I, I probably shouldn't have done that, but I did. <laughs> it was coffee with chocolate chunks Hagen dazs mm, so okay. it sound good it was it was good it was good so favorite ice cream flavor uh butter pecan oh my god yes love butter pecan um i love it you know I, i've been a butter pecan guy all my life mm-hmm. you know I, I got away from the you know the, the plain vanilla and strawberry i'm not a chocolate guy so okay. you know vanilla and strawberry but I tasted butter pecan, I think, when I was in college, and it's been my ice cream ever since. I like butter pecan. I haven't had it in a while. I need to. I used to pick the nuts out of it, though. Oh, like, I love the okay, nuts. Okay, see, that's I the gotta, thing about gotta, it, is I, I gotta, have a, I gotta have a place keep, oh, to place the nuts. I got to keep them nuts in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that was the one drawback for me. It was, was no, so I love, good. But I like, love that. All right, Byron. Well, last couple, let's do what was a sentimental moment with a fan that really stood out to you. You guys, mm. you know, with the Lakers, you guys had a lot of groupies. You guys mm. had a lot of people that was like lived and died with everything you guys did. But what was something that a fan that really touched you that to this day you still think about it like? 
Wow. A uh, fan when I was playing? Um, or yeah, you can pick. Play? Yeah, why don't you pick each one? Because you have fans now, obviously, too. Like, it's going to be indefinitely. But maybe as a, as a player, what stood out as a fan as a player? Like, somebody that you were like, that was oh, super man. cute or that was super, like, sentimental. Um, It's funny because uh, him and I are now friends. It, it was a fan that I met when I was in Minnesota. Okay. And uh, his name is Paul. And Paul oh, came to the game. To yep, shout out to Paul, my man Paul in, <laughs> Paul, in, Minnesota. in Minnesota. Okay, very cool. And Paul came to the game, and oh. after the game he had something for me to sign, and I signed it, and he, he basically started telling me my whole career. You Damn, know, he really college, <laughs> pros at that particular time. He's been a fan for so many years and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. I said, man, that's pretty cool. You mm -hmm. know, so I signed it. And then, of course, we come back the next year month or whatever we play there twice he's there again so we start talking and um he's been you know on my facebook and instagram and always oh. you know always call him back um that's so cool. and talk to him that that's one and oh, then that's inspiring yeah and then the other one uh lives in dallas his name is paul and paul okay. <laughs> okay. met me as a rookie okay and um we went downstairs and you know had a drink and exchange numbers and we've been friends ever since as well so wow, I love it. those two guys uh that i met when i was playing just really struck me as just really good people Aww. and we've had a friendship ever since but some of the best stories for me are fans that went to my basketball camp you know I, i'll run into a kid at the uh at the gym mm -hmm. a few years ago that said you know i'm 40 something years old now but i used to go to your basketball camps and i i, I still Aww. to this day used to love that you were there every day because you didn't just put your name on it. You actually Did, showed I, up I showed and like up were a part of it. Every day. I love it. Did the drills, you know, played the kids one on one. I used to tell them, I said, if you were, if you were um, eight, nine, ten years old, because the camp was from eight years old to 17. If mm -hmm. you're eight, nine, ten years old, get a couple of friends. I'll play you guys one against three. If you're 11, 12, and 13, you know, I'll play you guys one against two. If you're 14 and up, it's one on one. Oh, okay, so you had different and, tiers. Yeah, I had different like tiers. <laughs> but it was always when I win, you guys got to run suicides at the end of okay. camp. And if they, and, you know, of course, kids, well, what if we win? I said, that's not going to happen. Right. And I never <laughs> lost. And then when the camp was over, you know, the fan, you know, not the fans, I'm sorry, the parents would come to pick the kids up mm -hmm. and the kids would be on the, on the line running. And the parents were like, why are they running? I said, because they challenged me to a basketball game. Wow. And this is their this is their you know punishment for thinking they can beat me wow so i've had a, i've had a number of kids come up to me and and tell me about my camps and, and that's that's really kind of cool right because you know, you're involved that. and you really yeah. put your stamp on it more than just a name you're actually nah, there i was gonna be there every single day having fun going through i would even referee some of the games you know nice. so i i really enjoyed that i, I love the interaction with kids anyway because they're so honest mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah kids are you know, super honest you know they don't care you know they're just so honest so i, I love yeah. that i love it i love it well byron we're gonna end we're gonna do last two we're gonna do we're gonna talk music okay, okay. So oh let's love do, music let's do i like music too i was we'll, we'll talk about what i was listening to on the way here but um let's do first favorite old school artist or band and then let's do favorite current artist so let's take it back oh, wow. like it could have been somebody that was out back when like you guys were playing yeah so let's do that one first, and then we're going to do current. So old school, and we're going to bring it back to now. Uh, old school band was uh, Isley Brothers. Okay, between like between the sheets or whatever. Oh, like, okay. Between the sheets, brown eyed girl. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, ev ev pretty much everything that they put out back in the day. Okay. I was a big fan. I, I love the Isley Brothers. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, my parents took me to the Whispers concert, and then I saw them when I was covering the NFL. I saw two of the Whisper Brothers on the plane, and they were like, "How do you know who we are? You're young." I'm like, "I went to your concert." Yeah. So I I love Isley's Whispers. Like shout out to like the old school guys. They're still doing it. Earth, They're older. Fire. I mean, it's, okay. It's, yeah, all yeah. those. But I think the Isley's was my favorite. Okay. But I mean, I love Earth, Wind, and Fires. You know, the Commodores, the OJ's. I mean, the okay. Dramatics. I loved all those old school uh, groups. Okay. You know. Okay. Yeah, we we got a shout out to some of the classics. Okay. Yeah, what absolutely. about current current artists? Who's somebody now that you like that's uh, out currently? That's out currently? Yeah. Uh, are we talking about, uh, uh, see, again, I, well, I, I okay. do so many different. There's so many different. Okay, yeah, yeah, but there's I, and, and there's my R&B. And yeah, okay, let, yeah, let's do let's do R&B. Let's do R&B. And then if you want to pick rap, too, like, let's do R&B first and rap. Yeah, uh, uh, R&B, I'm still a big Jeffrey Osborne fan. Is he still out, though? He's still, or? He's okay. still out. He's still, okay. he's still relevant. Okay. I mean, 
Okay. He's still doing his thing. Okay. He's, he's, he's got an album that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Okay. Wow. Well. I haven't like, heard from him in a so while. So okay. I, I love Jeffrey. Okay. You know, but I, I'm old school. And, I mean, when it comes to rap, I mean, Drake right now. I, okay. I'm a big Drake fan. Big Drake guy. You know, okay. I, I think Drake is fantastic. Uh, but like I said, I'm old school. I love, you know, Luther Vandross back in the day. Oh, yeah. yeah I love Beyonce. I mean, who, who doesn't love Beyonce? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Beyonce is amazing. Luther Vandross has a song called Anyone That Had a Heart. I went through mm. a, like a really bad breakup mm. one year and I was just playing that on repeat over and over. Anyone that had a heart. I was just like si sitting by myself. <laughs> that, that is one of my favorites. Yes. Uh, it was a sad house is not a home. Houses in a home. Of, okay. Yeah, one of my favorites. So okay. I got I got a, a, a just a ton of artists that I love. It's you know, it's that simple. I'm, I'm a big Anita Baker fan mm -hmm. you know, back in the day. I even love uh, you know, Snoop Dogg, obviously, you know, Shout Tupac, out to Snoop, Dre, Tupac Even Productions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love Ice him. Cube. Ice Cube, I mean, so I, I, many. Yeah, so many. Well, so you know, many of those all guys. Those good, all those guys. So many of those guys are legends. And Byron, you certainly are a legend. We want to thank you for inviting us into your home. We're in the cognac room. The sun yes. is setting. It's a yeah. Friday night. We battled traffic to get here, but it was like <laughs> so worth it to come and hang out with Byron. So Byron, we covered a lot. Is there anything you want to shout out that we for that we, we talked about your podcast? We talked about so much. Anything else you want to promote or shout out while we're still buzzing no, right man, now? No, okay. I, I think you already shouted out the podcast. The podcast, so, yeah. You know, definitely go check it out. Like I said, the first episode is uh, September 29th. Right. That will be with James Worthy. He got a story at the end that I, I guarantee you nobody in this world has heard of. Yeah. That is funny as hell. Yeah, I, you, you gotta watch. Okay, it. The, I, that's like the teaser. I was already gonna listen, like watch and listen, yeah. but now I'm like really gonna listen because yeah. I want to find out what Big Game James <laughs> has to say on that. Well, Byron, congrats on Thank everything. You. We Thank like we you. said, we really appreciate you. You're doing big things. People are gonna watch these interviews. Live on my channel forever. So, you know, September. But then you can always find his podcast whenever you see this. There's people that'll watch this years from now, and they can always go back and listen to your podcast and stuff like that. And guys, I want to circle back. So proud to be a Ridge wallet partner. This wallet as a college athlete, somebody that's always running on the beach, wearing my bikini. Like I stick this in the back and I, I'm able to just like go get something to eat. I don't have to carry a purse. I don't have to carry something bulky. Like I said, we're going to show a picture of this wallet compared to my bulkier wallet. And you're going to see a major difference on that side by side on how compact this is and how versatile this is. 12 cards could fit in here. 40,000 five star reviews. That's like crazy. So shout out to Ridge for partnering with me. And I love, I don't put my name behind anything that I don't use. You guys see, I've got the money in the back. This fits up to 12 cards, like I mentioned earlier. And I want to thank you guys so much. I want to thank my audience, 10 total million views, 10 million views. This is me on my own away from the TV side of my career, interviewing amazing athletes. Michael Cooper invited me to the house. Byron Scott invited me to his house. Kawhi Leonard had me as the only reporter at, at his youth camp. David Beckham, only reporter at his event. When the, the crowd collapsed on us, my camera guy, Alan, was there. <laughs> I struck gold when I hired him. He knows how to handle all these situations. Snoop Dogg having me as the only reporter at his Snoop youth, um, youth football game. So many NFL players driving two and three hours to come and do interviews with me. So I am just so, we've worked really hard. I'm so proud to showcase these interviews with you guys. I really hope you guys continue to keep watching. I love you guys. I wouldn't have this kind of success without you guys. So thank you guys so much for watching, supporting. Make sure you guys subscribe. And I cannot wait to see you guys next time. Coming to you this time from Byron's house. And we cannot wait to see you where we end up next. I love you guys.